Hello everyone and welcome to the June meeting of the Murder Mystery Book Club. Our title for this month is The Devil and the Dark Water by Stuart Turton. This is a quick and friendly spoiler warning that discussion past this point and in the comments of the video post will include spoilers for the novel. If you haven't yet read it, copies are available through the library's Hoopla database. As I begin recording, I have to give you all an apology in advance for any mispronunciations of the Dutch names. I promise you I will do my best and mean absolutely no disrespect. That in 1634, our story begins on the docks of Batavia. Sammy Pips, a prisoner, is being taken on board a ship, while his friend Arend Hayes acts as a bodyguard, attempting to shield him from stones and other items thrown from the crowd surrounding them. Sammy is being transported on a ship to Amsterdam to await trial on charges, though neither he or Arend are 100% sure on what those charges are. Also boarding the ship is Governor General Jan Han and his family. Before anyone is able to board the ship, the Sadarm, a leper appears at the top of a pile of crates, issuing a dark warning that his master sails aboard the ship. Quote, he is the lord of hidden things, all desperate and dark things. He offers this warning in accordance with the old laws. The Sadarm's cargo is sin and all who board her will be brought to merciless ruin. She will not reach Amsterdam. End quote. After issuing his dire warning, the leper bursts into flames and burns alive in front of the terrified passengers. Arend is able to douse the flames and save the leper's life, but he realizes that the man's tongue has been cut out, and he would have been incapable of giving the warning. Jumping from her carriage, the Governor General's wife, Sarah, approaches the leper and gives him a special tonic used to relieve pain. Knowing that his wounds will prove fatal, Sarah asks Arendt to grant the leper a quick and painless death, which he does. Though Arendt begs for his friend Sammy Pips to be set free in order to investigate this strange occurrence, the Governor General refuses, ordering Pips to be secured in a small compartment barely big enough for him to lie curled up in. The Governor General is more concerned with two pieces of cargo. A personal item of his that remained shrouded in secrecy in an item known as the Folly. The Folly is described as too large to effectively hide, and it's suggested that it would be best to treat it as nothing more than an unwanted piece of furniture to avoid any suspicions being raised. However, the Governor General feels that this will leave the item too exposed and that it is too valuable to remain unguarded throughout the voyage. It's revealed that the folly had been stolen earlier, and Sammy Pips and Arendt had traveled to Batavia in order to recover it. After a successful completion of their mission, they were treated as heroes, making it all the more strange that Sammy suddenly finds himself in chains, treated as the worst sort of criminal. As the passengers continue to board, we're introduced to Leah, the daughter of the Governor General and his wife, along with the Governor's mistress, Kreji and her sons Marcus and Osbert. While everyone is distracted with the arrival of the noble passengers, a man named Sander Kurz climbs aboard the boat along with his ward Isabel, a local woman. Sander's main concern seems to be a book in his possession, which when opened is described as showing whores on every page. Knowing that Sammy Pips will not be allowed free, Arendt and Sarah begin investigating the leper and his warning to the ship, fearful that somebody may attempt to sink it before it reaches its destination. As the ship begins to get underway, the mainsail is unfurled, exposing a disturbing image of an eye with a tail drawn on it in ash. This image has a particularly strong effect on Kresijen, Sander Kurz, and Arendt, whose own wrist is scarred with that same image. Arendt has carried that scar since he was a young boy when he had gone hunting with his father. Three days after setting out, Arendt had been found wandering alone in the road, injured and soaking wet. No trace of his father had ever been found and Arendt could not remember any of the events during that missing time. When Arndt becomes involved in an argument, the Governor General steps in to defend him, revealing that he is in fact Arndt's uncle. His uncle warns him to distance himself from Pips in an effort to protect himself from being named as a conspirator in Pips' crimes. After his father's disappearance, Arndt was shunned even by his own family, and in a fit of anger, snuck out of his home and carved the same 
image that had been put on his wrist into another villager's door. In the morning, that villager too was shunned, the townspeople believing the mark proof that they had invited the devil into their home. Though Arndt continued to place the mark on the door of villagers who had heard him, he eventually stopped when he realized how out of control the entire situation was becoming. However, by then it was too late. The entire town consumed with fear and suspicion as a witch hunt began, culminating in the murder of a village outcast named Old Tom. But the mark continued to appear around the provinces, bringing with it misfortune. The Governor General asked Arn to investigate the leper's claims and ensure that there is no sabotage taking place on board the ship. Though he refuses to turn the ship around and wait for that investigation to be completed before sailing to Amsterdam. That night, the leper, wrapped in bloody bandages, appears outside of Sarah's cabin, peeking into her porthole window. Although seven ships left Batavia with the Sadarm, that night an eighth light is seen out on the water. Knowing that the eighth light does not belong to their convoy of ships, and believing it may potentially be a pirate vessel, Battle stations are armed, however, the light itself vanishes before dawn. The next morning, Sander Kurz, a predicant, offers a church service on board the ship and explains to Sarah and Crege that his book is actually a taxonomy of devils, quoting that it lists their hierarchies, their particular methods of corruption, and how to rid ourselves of them. It's a witchfinder's greatest weapon. Everybody in my order keeps their own copy. The morning reveals another dark clue, as when Sarah inspects the hull outside of her porthole, she finds handprints charred into the wood of the ship. It is revealed that the Governor General, along with Arndt's grandfather, had been the ones who had initially summoned Old Tom all those years ago, offering the demon the life of Arndt's father as payment for their bargain. The next night, the mysterious Eighth Lantern returns, but this time it begins to glow red. At the same time, the livestock on board the ship are brutally slaughtered, the mark of Old Tom left at the scene drawn in their blood. As dawn approaches, passengers and crew hear a voice whispering to them in the darkness, promising them their heart's desire for a price. The next morning, Sander Kurz is found missing, and, and a dangerous storm forces the ship to take emergency measures to try to outrun it. Though the Sadarm is able to stay ahead of the worst of the storm, for two weeks it stays on their heels, almost as if it's able to track the ship. Finally unable to run any longer, the ship prepares emergency measures in order to weather the storms. Though the Sadarm survives the storm, it's badly damaged and blown off course, leaving the ship stranded and alone. It's believed that the Folly will be able to save the ship, but when they open the box, they find it completely empty. The Governor General, however, refuses to listen to reason or allow an investigation to proceed, declaring that until the folly is returned, a random member of the crew will be lashed every morning, every day. The Eighth Lantern continues to appear night after night, leaving the crew on edge and suspicious. On the night it glows red again, the Governor General is found murdered in his cabin, a cabin that was locked and guarded. As the ship descends into chaos, Drecht, captain of the musketeers guarding the governor general, declares mutiny against the ship's crew. As a massive fight breaks out between the sailors and the musketeers, several are injured and killed until the ship is severely damaged running into rocks. Those who survive able to make their way to the beach and onto a deserted island. With many of the passengers and crew severely injured and few supplies at hand, the decision is made to send out a small lifeboat in the hopes of finding any other ship in the area that may provide assistance. Arend insists that Sammy, who has suffered severe injuries of his own, be aboard that ship. As Arend explores the island, he finds shelters and supplies enough for everyone to survive comfortably, almost as if they were expected to arrive on that island. Arndt keeps his discovery secret from the others, and as he and Sarah explore the wreck of the Sadarm, they are able to piece together the final details of this mystery. That night, after a bit of theater, it is revealed that Crege was behind the entire plot all along. 
The Eighth Lantern and all the activities perpetrated by the demon Old Tom had been nothing more than theater, meant to distract from the intended purpose, killing the governor. The initial plan was that after the murders were committed, the captain would take the Sadarm to the island where the housing and supplies were waiting and have passengers and crew disembark. This would ostensibly be for their own protection while a thorough search of the ship was done for the perpetrator. Such a plan could not have been pulled off alone though, and Crege hadn't counted on the greed of her co-conspirators, causing them to betray her. When Governor General Han saw the chaos that was caused by Arendt carving that mark into doors, he realized he had found a powerful way to dispose of his noble enemies. By using the symbol to create a false witch hunt, Crochet's own family was one of the victims of those witch hunts, turned on by their friends and neighbors who believed that they were in league with evil. She spent her life since vowing to get vengeance on those who ruthlessly destroyed her family and her home. However, she could never have carried off this entire plan by herself, and in fact had significant help from her brother, Sammy Pips. She and Sammy had changed their names and spent years putting together a long con, allowing them to get close enough to the people who had destroyed their lives in order to destroy theirs. Quote, it wasn't enough to kill him, Sarah. We wanted him to know what it felt like to be hounded and haunted the way we had been as children when the mark of old Tom started appearing across our lands and strangers were beating on our gates accusing us of witchcraft. We wanted Jan to know he was going to die and be powerless to prevent it, the way we were when the mob finally stormed our home, butchered our parents, and burned our world to the ground. We wanted him to know our terror. Sammy and Crege offer Sarah and Arendt a bargain. They can allow the brother and sister to go off in peace, with the Governor General's treasure split between them and the other passengers, or they can remain alone on the island. However, Sarah sees a third option, to resurrect old Tom but turn him to a noble purpose, to allow Sammy and Crege to make amends for all the innocents who were hurt during the course of their plan. As Sarah points out, the world is full of wealthy, powerful people who commit grave atrocities and never see any punishment for it. But what if old Tom could provide that punishment? Quote, what if the next time a king led an army to slaughter, then fled the battlefield in cowardice, Old Tom was waiting in his castle? Thrilled with the idea of such a constant challenge in life, Sammy and Crege agreed to use their treasure and resources in order to help Arendt and Sarah root out evil in the world and deliver justice of a sort. I really enjoyed this novel, finding it jam-packed with twists, turns, and surprises. There's something new to discover on every page and several events that I didn't touch on in the synopsis because I don't want to give everything away. The novel provides a fascinating look at a locked room style mystery with the events taking place almost entirely on the ship in the middle of the ocean. The characters and reader are left to wonder how such extraordinary, virtually impossible feats are being pulled off in such a confined space along with the dark knowledge that if a supernatural creature is not to blame, then by default the killer must be one of them. Sammy and Arendt clearly share a Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson style relationship, and it's fascinating throughout the novel to see Arendt come more into his own as a detective, and to see Sammy playing both the part of hero and villain as he investigates his own crimes. The novel raises a fascinating question on the idea of what justice is and where it can be found. Many believe that those who have great wealth and power in society will never have to face the consequences for their actions. However, does that make it right to go after them outside of the law? Is that justice or revenge? Can it be both? These are just my thoughts though and I really want to know what everyone else thinks. Did the mystery keep you guessing, or were you able to figure it out by the end? Do you feel that Sammy and Crege were justified in their attempt to seek vengeance against those who had started the madness that led to their family's deaths? What are your thoughts on the ending and the idea of using the mythology of Old Tom to go after those who are too rich and powerful to ever stand trial or be convicted in a court of law? Do you believe that justice can be found outside the legal system, and that it should be when the system fails? or that it is wrong to take the law into your own hands no matter the circumstances. 
Please share your thoughts and opinions in the comment section of this video. I can't wait to hear what everyone thought. Don't forget to stay tuned to the library's website and social media for the most up-to-date information on our upcoming programs and events. We've got a lot of great things planned this summer, and I can't wait to see everyone at the next Murder Mystery Book Club. Bye!